We have a unique nation, a republic, like no others. And so this must be unique. This will be our nation's capital. Clearly, a lot of the designers and architects of Washington, D.C. were Masons, starting with George Washington himself, who was a guiding force. I do not believe that there are any secret plans or designs related to Freemasonry. Well, it was definitely designed according to Masonic principles. The streets are laid out that way. The buildings are laid out that way. Conspiracists are always looking under their bed for evidence that there is some vast conspiracy. And Masons may very well say that they really aren't influential as far as Washington, D.C. is concerned, and yet the cornerstone was laid by Masons. You see that the inverted five-pointed star, which is the goat of Mindy's, built into the streets of Washington, D.C. No, there are no satanic plans in the street plans of Washington, D.C. There is a pentagram to the north of the White House. But the streets don't actually connect to form a pentagram. This is geometry. It happens. No one could have that happen accidentally. The anti-Masons want to show that there is some demonic conspiracy. It's Baal worship. That's what you're involved in. That is what masonry is based upon, the power of the dragon. In a word, hogwash. When you want to talk about symbols and what they mean, you really have to look at who's authored these symbols. With symbols, there are always multiple levels. Symbols reveal and they conceal. And that's why they're used, and that's why they're so important. They reveal to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. And if I would have told you this 15 years ago, I might have gotten shot. When they're shooting at you, you know they're serious. Absolutely, there's absolutely no well, way then, we can compromise. Throw the entire thing out. Oh, happily. Dude, this area I here, beg your this pardon. This is not going to work. This is not going to work. You're absolutely right. You have had Ooh, enough. Fine. Thank you. From its beginning, the design for Washington, D.C. has been a source of conflict and heated debate. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, a temperamental French architect, a famous African-American, and a mysterious surveyor what set in motion a project that would span the next 150 years with no end of controversy in sight. But beyond debates at an internal level, the very layout of the city is continually under suspicion. Arcane symbols and mythological designs, both inside and outside government buildings, have caused many to wonder if the city somehow represents a hidden agenda. This becomes increasingly important as America's current place on the world stage ignites firestorms of controversy. As the United States is the most powerful nation on earth, many have wondered, what is America up to? Could the purpose of operations currently carried out by the U.S. government somehow be reflected in the design of its capital city? At the center of controversy are secret societies. Many of America's leaders have belonged to them right from the nation's beginning. Our current president, George W. Bush, has admitted to his membership in the mysterious Skull and Bones Society. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. 
It's so sick that we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go wild. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the web. Number 322. <laughs> <laughs> Skull and Bones has to be the most powerful, one of the darkest of all secret societies that exists on this planet. It is about greed and it is about power. The idea for Skull and Bones is said to have come out of Germany in the early part of the 19th century. The society was founded at Yale University by William Huntington Russell, along with Attorney General and Secretary of War Alfonso Taft, whose son, William Howard Taft, would go on to become America's 27th president. Some believe the society's foundation demonstrates a clear link with what may be the oldest society of all. Freemasonry. The society is shown here in 1993 reenacting the laying of the cornerstone for the United States Capitol on the 200th anniversary of the event. Know all of you who hear me, we proclaim ourselves free and lawful Masons, true to the laws of our country, professing to revere God and to confer benefits upon mankind. This is the ceremony in which Senator Strom Thurmond, himself a 33rd degree Mason, took part. Senator Thurmond, we would like you to join in this. Since the William Morgan incident in 1826, when Americans uncovered a secret cabal working inside the government, the presence of Masonry in places of power has always sparked debate. But their influence in American government is undeniable. This is the same Bible upon which Presidents Clinton, Bush, Carter, and George Washington were inaugurated president. Of America's 43 presidents, at least 15 are confirmed Masons, though some say the number is even greater. In addition to the Capitol, the Freemasons have laid the cornerstone for every major building in Washington, D.C. The cornerstones of the President's House, known to us as the White House, the Washington Monument, the Smithsonian, Independence Hall in Philadelphia, incidentally by pa past Grand Master Benjamin Franklin, and Constitution Hall, stand out among many others as outstanding examples of cornerstones which have been laid Masonically. The cornerstone of the United States Capitol, however, stands out above all buildings erected in the free world as the seat of government for our people. This bronze plaque, located inside the U.S. Capitol, marks the spot where the original cornerstone was laid by George Washington, the first American president and a Freemason. George Washington is probably the most famous Mason in the world. The George Washington Masonic Memorial is entirely dedicated to the idea of Washington as a Freemason. Now, we do know that uh, Washington uh, participated in the laying of the cornerstone of the United States Capitol as a Masonic ceremony, and he wore his regalia as a Master Mason. And he laid the cornerstone and performed the ceremony of laying the cornerstone. Washington's participation in the event was recorded by the newspaper of the time, the Columbian Mirror, which can still be obtained through the Library of Congress. Laying the cornerstones of buildings which serve mankind is one of the world's most ancient customs. The cornerstone laying ceremony predates Freemasonry, um, although its early s symbolic purposes uh, as, a, as a sacrifice to appease the gods uh, or, or demons or whatever in, in prehistorical times, of course, has no application to why Freemasons do it. The corn, wine, and oil that we, uh, that we use for this are, are also ancient symbols. Corn is the symbol of plenty. Why in the symbol of refreshment and oil the symbol of joy and gladness. While masonry maintains these symbols as a representation of blessing, there are some who believe they hold a more hidden meaning. 
with symbols, there are always multiple levels, up to seven different levels of interpretation with every particular symbol. Corn is an important symbol in masonry and is one found repeatedly in Washington, D.C. But what sort of hidden meaning could apply to corn? In Hebrew, the word for corn is Dagan, which became the name of a Babylonian god. Some believe the same god was adopted by the Phoenicians under the name Dagon. While Dagon was often worshipped as the fish god, he was also the god of corn. His son was known as Baal, who was often called the son of Dagan or the son of corn. Now, corn, of course, if we're talking about um, pre-New World times, would, would be any grain or wheat. To complicate matters further, in the Old Testament, we find the children of Israel offering corn and wine and oil to Yahweh, the God of the Bible. Yet at some point, God's anger was kindled against them for turning the sacrifice into idolatry. In the book of Hosea, God says of Israel, she did not know that I gave her the corn and wine and oil, which they prepared for Baal. Notice again this Phoenician version of Baal, as a bearded man with strong features. Could Baal have been the model for the bearded male images that appear throughout Washington, D.C.? Take note of this image with ears of corn carved into the hair. According to legend, Baal was once slain by the god of death and taken into the underworld. But at some point, he was resurrected, or as it is sometimes called, awakened. At Haynes Point in Washington, D.C., is found this mysterious statue of a bearded giant rising up out of the ground or perhaps out from his grave. The statue is called the Awakening. According to the Masonic Encyclopedia, another symbol for resurrection is the Egyptian obelisk, which is the shape of the Washington Monument. The word obelisk is sometimes translated Baal's shaft or the shaft of Baal. As a result, critics of masonry argue that Baal, not Yahweh, is the real God to whom Masons perform their ceremony. It's not until you get to the Royal Arch degree that all of a sudden you realize uh, who God is or what the name of God is. It's hidden for a long time. In fact, you're told that there's this hidden word you're supposed to search for. But it's not until you finally get to that degree that you realize that uh, His name is revealed. It's believed that at the higher levels, the Masons secretly worship Baal under a hidden and unusual name. As you go higher up in the masonry, you learn the secret name of God, which is a, a secret and the, the lost word that the masons in the Blue Lodge see. They already know it. It's Jobulun. It's a combination of Jehovah, Baal, and Osiris. It's a deity that is not the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But nowhere in that Scottish Rite degree, and I have to stress that this is an additional degree, this is not a part of regular craft Freemasonry, nowhere in that additional degree, is there ever any suggestion that Jubilon is the name of a god? What it is, is a, is a amalgam of three different words, which in ancient languages was the word for god. Coyle's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, he admits on page 516 that Jebulon is basically a composite of three different names of different gods. Uh, Jeh, meaning Jehovah, or, or the Syriac name of God, as he says. And then uh, Baal, or he says Bel, B-E-L, or Baal, he spells it B-A-A-L, how the Bible spells Baal, or Baal, it's pronounced in Hebrew, uh, which is the Canaanite god. And then he gives on for the Egyptian god, referencing uh, many Masons reference Osiris. 
And it's interesting because when you look at what he's said there, he's admitting that the Masonic name for God includes Baal or Baal. It's not intended to represent a god. Its only use in the ritual is as a password to gain entry to the, to the lodge. It's a demonic god. It's Baal worship. That's what you're involved in. It is the word for God in three ancient languages, three ancient civilizations. And that's all it is. The Mason is actually worshiping Baal. Jebulon, Je on and Osiris, and just using the name of Jehovah, which is also wrong because God warns not to use his name in vain. Freemasonry is often attacked uh, and accused of being a religion simply because it promotes a belief in God. But nowhere in the teachings of Freemasonry does it promote any specific attributes of God. See, belief in God is faith. Belief about God is religion. From a, a biblical Christian standpoint, and as a Christian, I have to really take issue with this because there are many scriptures from, from Genesis to Revelation that condemn idolatry and worshiping other gods. In Freemasonry, to make it easy for men of all faiths to meet together, we use the expression great architect of the universe. Now that's not a name, that's a description. Uh, much the same as grand geometrician is a description. Um, of, uh, of an attribute of, of God. Grand geometrician or great architect refers to his attribute as the great creator. But men of all faiths can accept that description of their God. God warns about an admixture or a synergism or a synchronistic view of mixing different gods with his name. And that's something he's very clear about that we're, we're not to do. In fact, it's interesting, Baal or Baal is depicted uh, in the New Testament by the Jews as well as Jesus. He's called the ruler of demons. It's another name for Satan. Most scholars agree that Baal became synonymous with the devil. Yet Masonry insists its view of God is without definition. For the Mason, the corn, wine, and oil ceremony might as easily be dedicated to Baal as to any other god. Nevertheless, the conflict between Masonry and its critics goes on. Freemasonry is rationalist and humanist. It is not superstitious, and it is not involved in the occult. A lot of Masons don't have a clue as to the fact that, that the Masonic God is basically Satan. I think that's supremely arrogant of anyone who's not a Mason to believe they know more about Freemasonry than a Mason does. May corn, wine, and oil, and all the necessaries of life abound among the people of the world. And may this building be continued and preserved to the latest ages. What do these things really signify? Could it be an occult ceremony representing some sort of demonic conspiracy, as some suggest? Or is it merely a harmless practice to honor an ancient tradition? To investigate these things, we first review the beliefs of the secret societies that came to America. It is clear that the arcane symbolism in Washington, D.C. begins with them. When you want to talk about symbols and what they mean, you really have to look at who's authored these symbols, what, what was their intentions. Well, I think it's obvious that anybody who has the eyes to see can see that, that Washington, D.C. and indeed many other state capitals are festooned with occult symbols. Because these symbols come from the esoteric realm, it is important to define them according to the thinking of occult philosophers. Symbols reveal and they conceal. And that's why they're used and that's why they're so important. They reveal to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. And they, they conceal from those who do not have the eyes to see or ears to hear. In the book, Masonic and Occult Symbols Illustrated, we find this quote from Masonic author Charles G. Berger, who says that symbols came to have two meanings, the esoteric and the exoteric. The esoteric meaning was the true or original meaning, understood only by a few and closely guarded by them. The exoteric meaning was the invented or modified explanation intended for the many. 
This practice dates back to ancient Egypt and is explained by Dr. Robert Hieronymus, a member of a secret society called Co-Masonry and author of the book, Founding Fathers, Secret Societies. As with all secret societies, you have levels, and, and if you're on the lower levels, you don't even know their upper levels. You don't even, you don't even, they don't even tell you. You bump into it by accident or someone comes along. Now, in Scottish Rite, that's something different, you know, because they know that there's a... But before then, and basically secret societies, such as, let's go to ancient Egypt. To the ancient Egyptians, the priest would tell the serfs, the guys that tilled the land, they would say, the sun is God, okay? And, and, and so the, they accepted that very um, low-level interpretation, all physical. That's not what the priests believed. What the priests believed, there was a second level. Um, the priests believed that, nope, the physical sun is not the supreme being. It's the spirit which flows through the physical sun that is the supreme deity. However, there was another level. And the priests didn't even know it. It's those that were involved and, and, and elevated to, to um, if I would have told you this 15 years ago, I might have gotten shot. But what we're talking about, what we're talking about is the star Sirius. Uh, the dog star. The dog star, because the dog star was everything to the ancient Egyptians. Sirius is said to have been the most important star in the ancient world. It was considered the brightest star in the heavens, many times brighter than the sun. The Great Pyramid was built to synchronize with Sirius so that the light of the star would shine into the queen's chamber, supposedly to cast a beam upon an initiate during a ritual. Sirius is considered to be the, the dog star. It's considered to be the most evil star in the Egyptian pantheon. And the reason for this is because in ancient Egypt they depended on the Nile. And during the time when Sirius is in its ascendancy, which is in late July and early August, was the, was the time of drought. It was a time when the Nile was at its most, uh, its most weak in terms of being able to be being used for crops. And so the Egyptians thought this was a time of blasted blight, drought, and evil. It seems strange then that Sirius should be related to the founding of America. According to Masonic author David Ovison, the Declaration of Independence was signed when the sun was in alignment with Sirius in July of 1776. It is, however, appropriate that Sirius should be related to the most Egyptian-styled icon in America's capital city the Washington Monument. Ovison writes that in 1848, when the cornerstone of the Washington Monument was laid, the sun would have passed over Sirius. He goes on to say that in the course of the ceremonial, the star Sirius would have been seen on the eastern horizon. It would have been rising over the Capitol building to the east of the monument. The monument itself was originally designed by Freemason architect Robert Mills. Mills was trained by an Egyptian-style obelisk surrounded by a Roman colonnade with Greco-Roman looking statues all around it. According to the original plan, the monument should have been built directly south of the White House. But as with every plan, things change. When they went to build it, and when they calculated what the weight of the monument was going to be, they determined that that precise spot, that the foundations and the bedrock at that precise location would not safely support the weight of the monument. As a result, the monument was shifted slightly to the east. While it is not in a perfect alignment with the White House, it would end up in a perfect north-south alignment with the Masonic House of the Temple, which was built some years later. Masonic President James K. Polk. The project itself would take over 30 years to complete, 
during which time funding for the project would be scarce, the American Civil War would take place, and many ideas about the monument would develop. When the aluminum capstone was finally set on December 6, 1884, the end result would be a much simpler and more Egyptian figure than was first envisioned. The shift in design was the influence of George Perkins Marsh, the man considered the father of the modern environmentalist movement. In 1876, Marsh was the U.S. Minister to Italy. While there, he spent years studying the many obelisks which had been brought from Egypt. It was he who realized that the height of a traditional Egyptian obelisk was approximately ten times the base, causing the plan for the Washington Monument to be reduced from 600 feet to 555 feet. As for the colonnade and statues planned by Mills, Marsh wrote, throw out all the gingerbread of the Mills design and keep only the obelisk. While a true obelisk is fashioned from a single block of stone, the Washington Monument is made up of many stones. The hope of the Washington Monument Society was that the structure would reflect the idea of out of many, one. Meanwhile, the Pyramidion at the top is made up of 13 levels, just like that of the pyramid on the Great Seal of the Dollar Bill. But mysteries abound with the monument, not the least of which is the presence of a 12-foot obelisk beneath a manhole just a few hundred feet away from the Washington Monument. It appears to be a miniature replica of the monument itself, but as to why it is there, no one seems to know. Yet like the pyramid on the US dollar, this obelisk is missing a capstone. Meanwhile, Masonic author David Ovison is convinced that the Freemasons who signed the Declaration of Independence on July 4th and who laid the cornerstone for the Washington Monument on that same date would have been familiar with the rising of the Egyptian dog star Sirius as it is an important symbol in Freemasonry. Interesting thing about all of Freemasonry is, is symbolism is ultimately very important. They don't put a lodge in the east because it's a nice place and it looks good. They put it in, lodge, in the east, the masters have put it in the east so because it's the rising sun. It's the rising sun, you're catching the energies of the light. As Dr. Hieronymus revealed earlier, the real light shining in the east for the Egyptians was not merely the sun, but the light of the dog star, Sirius, which some believe holds a more sinister implication. This, this dog star also has relations to the idea of modern-day ceremonial magic and modern-day masonry. This was especially true for a 20th century occultist and Freemason, Aleister Crowley, who openly practiced ceremonial magic and was a member of a secret order called the Order of the Silver Star. The Silver Star was a reference to Sirius. Masons teach that at the center of every Masonic Lodge there's a five-pointed star right underneath the altar upon which the candidate is obligated. But the thing is, what they don't tell you is that five-pointed star represents Sirius, which is regarded as a satanic symbol. There is perhaps no symbol that evokes occult suspicion like the figure of the pentagram, which from ancient times was associated with the dog star Sirius. Masonic philosopher Albert Pike wrote that Sirius still glitters in our lodges as the blazing star. The blazing star is an ancient Gnostic term for Sirius and as shown here is symbolized in Freemasonry by the five-pointed star or pentagram. According to Pike, this symbol in Masonry dates back to the pentalpha of the Greek philosopher Pythagoras. The pentalpha gets its name for the five alphas or Greek letter A's which make up its composition. Typically in Freemasonry you see the five-pointed star with the nose point down. 
Now, there are even, there's even a division in Masonry which considers this the evil side of Freemasonry as opposed to the non-evil side. For example, Freemasonic lodges in New York do not use the nose side down uh, star. They turn it around so the nose is pointing up, and they consider that uh, a good variety of Freemasonry. Here is an upright Masonic star, which is another type of the blazing star mentioned earlier. Some believe this representation of Sirius may be the origin of the five pointed stars which adorn the American flag, as well as the stars that adorn the Statue of Freedom on top of the U.S. Capitol. Incredibly, these same five pointed stars were carved by Freemasons into the ceiling of Rosslyn Chapel in Scotland more than 500 years ago. Because Sirius is said to arise in the east, it also became known as the Eastern Star. To the Egyptians, Sirius was identified with the dog god Anubis, which is where the name Dog Star comes from. Anubis was said to have guarded the gates of death and was the protector of mysteries. Meanwhile, the Romans recognized Sirius as Janitor Lathaeus, or the Keeper of Hell. These dark associations may be the reason for the sometimes grim view of Sirius and the five-pointed star that represents it. But Sirius was also associated with the Egyptian goddess Isis. And here, as we connect the dots, a more complete picture begins to emerge. For the Egyptians, the rising of Sirius in the east preceded the annual flooding of the Nile River, which for them was a magical event. It was also the time that the goddess Isis would appear and give birth to Horus, the divine child of the Egyptian trinity. The all-seeing eye is also called the Eye of Horus, and in Freemasonry, Horus symbolizes the Masonic concept of a Christ. This is further represented by the hieroglyph used to denote Sirius. Notice the three symbols, an obelisk, a star, and a half circle. According to Egyptologists, the half circle is used to denote what is called the Benben, or the capstone used atop the pyramids. Throughout all history, it has been said that the capstone to the Great Pyramid of Egypt has been missing, which is why the all-seeing eye of Horus floats in its place above the pyramid on the back of the dollar bill. According to occult philosophers, the light which illuminates the eye comes not from the sun, but from the dog star Sirius, as is demonstrated by this illustration of the blazing star of masonry centered by an all-seeing eye. As Robert Balville writes, in many esoteric traditions, the return of the capstone of the Great Pyramid will signal the return of the Great Initiate, which, according to many prophecies, signifies the return of the Christ. Albert Pike describes the Masonic Trinity as expressed through Sirius and the symbols that are seen in most all Masonic halls. Notice this image with the sun on one side and the moon on the other, while the all-seeing eye sits in between with light blazing behind it. Pike writes that the sun and moon represent the two grand principles, the male and the female. Both shed their light upon their offspring, the blazing star or Horus. These philosophies have been known and practiced by secret societies for many centuries. As the evidence will show, designing cities as a reflection of occult tradition was not a new concept to the Founding Fathers, among whom the influence of Freemasonry seems undeniable. In fact, the 110th Congress of the United States on January 5, 2007 passed House Resolution Number 33 to honor the Freemasons
for their contribution throughout America's history. The number 33 is well known as the honorary degree of Scottish Rite Masonry. The House resolution read in part that the founding fathers of this great nation and signers of the Constitution, most of whom were Freemasons. The Masons felt in the United States that they were forming a Masonic Republic. The concept of a Republic dates back to the Greek philosopher Plato. Plato's uh, Republic, that's a utopian theme and that whole thing runs through our philosophy and thinking among the humanists to this day. They still think they would like to introduce uh, Plato's uh, Republic. Think about it. Every socialist uh, country that has gone socialist have always called themselves a republic for that very reason. It was Plato who likewise set down the earliest known record of ancient Atlantis. Centuries later, Sir Francis Bacon would set down the new Atlantis, a tale which some believe was meant to be a blueprint for the new world, one based upon the teachings of ancient philosophers. Bacon didn't invent this new Atlantis concept. He was merely the inheritor of it. He was probably the most articulate proponent of it ever in history, but uh, it preceded him. Bacon believed that the American continent was in fact the site of ancient Atlantis, a concept held by teachers of esoteric wisdom even today. A new Atlantis really was just America anyway. The east coast of America, if you take a look at the maps uh, by other clairvoyants who have studied Atlantis, indicates that the east coast of America was the west coast of Atlantis. This country, America, is the remnant of the ancient Atlantis and so is very susceptible to much of the of the history of Atlantis, the, the energies of Atlantis and some of the the actions, for instance the religion of Atlantis. According to esoterics, the religion of Atlantis was in fact the mystery school teachings that were embraced by the ancient philosophers. Yet it might be said that none have been as prolific on this subject as 20th century philosopher Manley P. Hall, who wrote such books as The Secret Destiny of America and America's Assignment with Destiny. It was Hall that many Freemasons are said to have called Masonry's greatest philosopher. In 1934, Hall founded the Philosophical Research Society in Los Angeles, California, an organization dedicated to exploring the wisdom of all the world's traditions. It began in 1934, and I think in this building, the library set was uh, finished in 1936. This is uh, one of the leading wisdom libraries in all of North America, if not, if not the most comprehensive itself. The Philosophical Research Library has been highly regarded by esoteric students from all over the world. It is composed of books and artifacts collected by Manley Hall throughout his lifetime. Among those who revered the library was President Franklin D. Roosevelt, a Freemason and student of esoteric tradition. And Mr. Roosevelt himself, you know, back in 1942, after the Pearl Harbor invasion, sent some of his people here to, to microfiche uh, the works of the, in this library because he looked upon it as a national treasure. He wanted to preserve it. When Hall died in 1990, his role as president of the society was succeeded by Dr. Obadiah Harris. Manley Hall, who was a young Canadian philosopher, sage type, envisioned um, re-establishing what he called um, the little Alexandrian library, which was, as you know, destroyed. Um, he was very fortunate in that as he was giving a talk, he was still in his, only, in his early 20s, a baroness, oil baroness, 
from uh, Ventura, who owned most of the oil wells in Ventura County, told him that she was going to take care of him for the rest of his life, that no matter what he needed to let her know, that she would see that he got it. And that she wasn't really joking, because I've looked at the records and back in the uh, early 30s, when most of the country was in depression, I don't know if California was really in one, but most of the world, the country was, she was giving him 50000 and and $100,000 at a time to go around and search out these, this wisdom literature in manuscript form and in book form. This proves interesting because much of Hall's highly financed research was dedicated to investigating the founding and purpose of America. Through his research, Hall became convinced that America had a secret destiny that was known by the arcane societies of the ancient world. Was it this information that compelled FDR to preserve Hall's literature? Like Hall, FDR also believed that America had a rendezvous with destiny. Hall's connections to the White House and FDR are mysterious, but do not end with the library. Hall was also involved with a mysterious Russian mystic named Nicholas Rorick. Rorick was a Rosicrucian and member of the Theosophical Society. He was said to be a kind of spiritual mentor to Henry Wallace, a 32nd degree Mason who would become FDR's vice president. It was Rorick's influence that inspired Wallace and ultimately FDR to place the great seal of the United States on the back of the dollar bill with the words Novus Ordo Seclorum, the new order of the ages. Dr. Harris, can you tell us about this, uh, this statue here? Oh, well, this would, this, this would be a, a very favorite thing to, to Manny Hall. This is Nicholas Rorick. Today, a statuette of Nicholas Rorick can be found at the PRS library. Well, actually, he lived even in, even in the 20th century. Up until what impact could the beliefs of men like Rorick and Manly P. Hall have had on the highest levels of America's government? They jumped a few decades from the New Deal because the, the, the Novus Ordum Seclorum can be translated to the New Deal in English as easily and readily as to the New Order or the New World Order. Um, I truly believe FDR believed that he was creating a New World Order uh, out of the Depression and that he had with him and, and had, you know, encircled himself by people who who would facilitate that dream these visions of, of new world order or new new world the, the world of democracy that's a part of the very soul that that gave birth to this country as the United States was born the design for its capital city would begin under the leadership of President George Washington who was himself a master mason. 150 years later, the fulfillment of its major construction with such buildings as the Jefferson Memorial, the National Archives, and the Pentagon would be completed under the leadership of another Masonic president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. But was the city erected to represent the country's concept of liberty or to reflect an ancient belief in America's destiny? According to Hall, Freemasonry plays a pivotal role in bringing forth this ancient plan. Manly P. Hall was a, was a Freemason, wasn't he? Right. He was a 33rd degree Mason. He was really important as far as trying to figure out uh, what the goals of Freemasonry are in this age. He, he gives you hints, just in, incredibly important hints, at what they're all about at the root level, what it is they're really striving for, what is their core inner doctrine, which they really don't like much revealing uh, to the rest of the world. According to Hall, one of the chief secrets of Masonry handed down through the centuries was the concept of democracy, which was said to be a threat to the kings and monarchs of the ancient world who ruled by divine right. 
yes, it had to be secret because the idea of democracy was um, was worse than heresy. It was treason. Nevertheless, these societies were determined to bring forth their great plan, no matter what the cost. In his book, The Secret Destiny of America, Manley P. Hall wrote that world democracy was the secret dream of the great classical philosophers, saying that the brilliant plan of the ancients has survived to our time, and it will continue to function until the great work is accomplished. Many researchers believe this great work is the secret behind the wars and rumors of war America has been involved in through the 20th century, right up to the present day. Could this plan of the ancients to establish a world democracy be the real hidden agenda of secret societies? And was this ancient plan echoed in the 2005 inaugural address given by President Bush? When our founders declared a new order of the ages, they were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. The occult is working at the highest levels of our society using the military and financial power of the United States to bring about this one world state. And the president has spoken openly about it, how the purpose of the United States is to bring democracy to the nations of the world. Where did this become the function of our nation to bring democracy to the world? You only need to read the writings of Mandy P. Hall where he tells you that for 3,000 years secret societies have been working to bring democracy to the world. You read President Bush's speech you know, uh, before the Association on Democracy, the National Association of Democracy. He tells you for 2,500 years people have been working to bring democracy to the world. Yet the ancient philosophers recognized that a true democracy could only be achieved by a society of perfected men. The perfected men would be comfortable in a true democracy. And probably a true democracy cannot emerge until there is enough of such human beings in the world that can take over the government of man. It will be that kind of leadership. It will be like Plato's vision of the philosopher king, the man who has wisdom, and the man who has power. Democracy has the occult promise of a fair world to live in. Now, you, you mentioned the, the occult promise. How would you define a term like that for an audience who's... Well, I'd probably uh, define that term by saying that 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 promise okay, is, is explain it, the word occult. Well, it's obsc it's know. obscure, it's it's uh, hidden, um, not visible to the normal eye. So an occult promise is something that is inherent, but only visible to those who have that inner vision. So. A fair world is a kind of occult promise at the heart of democracy. But is this occult promise part of America's Christian heritage? And if not, could this account for why the many symbols that adorn America's capital city come not from the Bible, but from the ancient mystery religion? And if America were really truly a Christian nation, what would all of these mythological uh, characters be in our city? Certainly the Christian influence was very strong. From the Christian point of view, we were formed as a Christian nation. But from the occultist point of view and those associated with astrology and the ancient mystery religions, America was, of course, to, and Washington, D.C. was to represent their position. So you've had the two forces you know, in America ever since its formation. While it seems that most of America's leaders have upheld Christian ideals, their reason for doing so is often questioned. If they were Christians, why would they erect monuments to pagan gods and goddesses? And if they were pagans, why confess to Christian ideals? Manley Hall suggests the reason may have been one of self-preservation. 
He argues that because of the persecutions of organized religion in the old world, the secret societies employed even greater methods of secrecy to protect their occult philosophies, making themselves sound as though their beliefs had to do with Christianity, which was the dominant belief in Europe, and eventually America. He says, the pagan intellectuals reclothed their original ideas in a garment of Christian phraseology, but bestowed the keys of the symbolism only upon those duly initiated and bound to secrecy. It is for this reason that all secret societies have an initiation process whereby members are bound by blood oaths not to reveal the secrets of the order. A chief factor that contributes to confusion about the beliefs of America's founders is the presence of Rosicrucianism. The Rosicrucians are a mystical arcane society that played a major role in the development of Freemasonry. The rose and cross which symbolize the society are also the source of its confusion. The rose is the symbol of secrecy and represents the pagan mystery religions while the cross symbolizes Christianity. Rosicrucianism is when the two are combined. Because of this, one can begin to understand how a man like Charles Thompson could be famous for his English translation of the Old and New Testaments and at the same time approve the design of the Great Seal for the United States with the all-seeing eye of Horus floating over an Egyptian pyramid. Thompson was closely associated with a man named Peter Miller, a well-known 18th century Rosicrucian and the leader of the Ephrata community in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. The Ephrata cloister is believed to have been the first esoteric settlement in the New World, with connections to some of the founding fathers, such as Benjamin Franklin and George Washington. The early Ephrata movement clearly held mystical beliefs even driving stakes into doorways to ward off evil spirits. We now know for a certain that they were Rosicrucians. It was Washington was close to these individuals, as well as Franklin and Washington and, and Jefferson. Benjamin Franklin even enlisted the aid of Peter Miller to translate the Declaration of Independence into a number of European languages and to inform the world of America's independence. The printing for these translations was done at the Ephrata Cloister. Peter Miller would have been further connected to many of the founding fathers through the American Philosophical Society, founded originally by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The Society's members included such prominent figures as Thomas Paine, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, the Marquis de Lafayette, George Washington, Charles Thompson, and of course, Peter Miller. Later members would also include such names as Charles Darwin and Thomas Edison. Franklin Society is thought to be directly related to the earlier concepts set forth by Sir Francis Bacon. According to Michael Howard in his book, The Occult Conspiracy, Franklin's American Philosophical Society was operated in the same tradition as the Royal Society in England, which was based on Sir Francis Bacon's Rosicrucian concept of the Invisible College. In the history of the Royal Society, they refer to the beginnings of the Royal Society came from a group of people who called themselves the Invisible College. The Royal Society was brought in after Bacon's day. In fact, Bacon had been dead, I think, about 50 or 60 years, and the Royal Society, uh, Society was then brought in. How it happened, I believe, was... Well, in fact, it, it's, it's documented so solidly that you can buy... Um, a, there's a book written by Thomas Spratt, who was the first president of the Royal Society. So this goes back to the uh, early 1700s, and he wrote a history on it. And he acknowledged there that Francis Bacon was the originator of the idea. The purpose of the Royal Society of London was to further Bacon's advancement of learning through scientific investigation. It is without question, however, that some of their work led to the metaphysical and the occult. And then we find that the Rosicrucians called themselves the Invis Invisible Brotherhood, and the, the College of Rosicrucians was therefore 
what was called by then the Invisible College. A Rosicrucian influence can be clearly seen in some of America's symbols. For example, this image of a pelican feeding her young appears in Manly Hall's secret teachings of all ages and is very common to Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. Now notice the great seal for the state of Louisiana. This particular replica is found inside the inner corridors of the U.S. Capitol. The Temple Church in London is a well-known Knight Templar church. Here we can see that the Golden Rosy Cross can be traced back to the mysterious knights. Now notice the arch surrounding the shrine. How a series of squares are shown with red and golden roses in the midst. The shrine opposite has a variation of the same design. Now consider this same pattern as it appears throughout the interior of the state capitol. Inside the old Supreme Court room and in various forms throughout the Library of Congress. Sir Francis Bacon became the chief of the Rosicrucians in England. His famous saying, knowledge is power, is found written inside the Library of Congress, while a statue of Bacon can be seen on the upper level. Elsewhere in the main library is a Baconian passage from his collection of essays. It reads, the inquiry, knowledge and belief of truth is the sovereign good of human nature. The saying is found over a statue representing philosophy. Could this be an indication that Baconian philosophy governs the New World concept? Bacon took his inspiration from the goddess Pallas Athena, known for her helmet of invisibility. Pallas Athena images also turn up throughout Washington, D.C. The Virginia State Seal bears the image of Athena with her foot upon a fallen king whose crown is cast aside. The word Six Semper Tyrannus, thus always to tyrants, written beneath. To the Romans, Athena was called Minerva. This painting of Minerva can be found in the Great Hall of the Library of Congress. At 15 and a half feet high, it is the most imposing image in the room. Notice she holds a spear that comes like a ray of light from the sun with a traditional helmet of Athena at her feet. This particular work was done by 19th century artist Elihu Vedder. Vedder was known as a symbolist painter whose style was part of a movement that can be traced to France during the 19th century and an art house called the Salon de la Rose Croix. Yes, they were a group of Rosicrucian artists known for promoting symbolic and often bizarre imagery. Some of which, like the image of the satyr, seems to be repeated inside the Library of Congress. It's not clear if Vedder himself was a Rosicrucian, but one of his chief influences certainly was. William Butler Yeats was a prominent member of the Golden Dawn, a Rosicrucian secret society. Yeats, along with Irish mystic William Blake, are said to be two of Vedder's leading inspirations. Vedder's own occult themes are filled with haunting esoteric imagery, like this work, which is called The Cup of Death. In addition to Minerva, Vedder was commissioned to do a series of paintings illustrating government, which can be found at the east end of the Great Hall in the Library of Congress. Now let's look again at this image from the Salon de la Rose Croix. It pictures Leonardo da Vinci on the right, dressed like Joseph of Arimathea, whom occultists believe was the original cupbearer for the Holy Grail. Beside him is Dante Alighieri, dressed 